uh, done a new setup of chairs this morning that Liz and I are affectionately referring to as the rainbow. So uh, anyone who's in the back, please feel free to come forward and join us in the rainbow. And by anyone, I mean the table of New Yorkers who refuses to mix with anyone right over there. Um, so this is a little bit of a sort of open session. Maria, let me actually start by doing that. Um, standing next to me is Maria Rosario Jackson, Good morning, who everyone. I think a lot of you guys know, both from her work uh, at the Urban Institute as well as her work now with the Kresge Foundation, as well as ha uh, serving as, as a member of the National Council on the Arts, which is how we've gotten to know each other better than we had known each other before That's right. from when I was at the NEA. And so I asked Maria to sort of uh, tag team this with me. And what we're hoping to do with this morning session is sort of as a group, think through sort of what we've heard over the past two days, what are the themes we've picked up on, and then perhaps the most important thing is what are the things that we collectively think we can get done and should get done um, in the next little bit. So a quick note on social media, everyone who's been tweeting, please keep tweeting with hashtag ArtPlace. Uh, this morning, we're also going to incorporate Facebook because we should have more social media in everything. And we're going to capture <laughs> some of uh, the ideas that we're discussing and actually going to post them on ArtPlace's Facebook page and ask people in the room to feel free to comment, people who are watching at home uh, to feel free to comment, and people who want to sort of come back um, and do it later. So I'm going to, uh, in a moment, ask Maria to sort of kick us off by asking her about a couple of the themes and, and things she's heard and picked up over the past couple of days. But I wanted to sort of share two stories to help get us collectively in the same mind space going into this session. And so the first, is Donna here? There's Donna from Worm Farm. Uh, if you haven't met, Donna Newworth from Worm Farm Institute is here. And I was in a session with her yesterday and one of the projects that Worm Farm does is called Fermentation Fest. And what Donna talked about yesterday was sort of fermentation as a celebration of abundance. So whether you're turning um, grain into beer, whether you're turning milk into cheese, or whether you're turning cabbage into kimchi, it's much better to sort of transform and make use of something, and this was the sort of money quote, than let your abundance rot in the field. So our goal for this morning is to not let our collective abundance rot in the field. <laughs> um, the second story, which um, I'll tell on Polly Carl, who's going to be one of our mic runners, and you guys remember from Monday afternoon, is Polly, um, like me, I think sort of came up professionally in offices where you sort of had assistants and you had people who uh, did things, and particularly who did things for you. And when Polly first came to start working in the commons environment, she was in that same mind frame. And she would turn to a colleague and say, hey, I need this. And the colleague would smile right back at her and say, great, let me show you how to do it. And Polly would say, no, 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 you don't understand. I need this. And her colleague would say, yeah, no, I know. Let me show you how to do it. So this isn't necessarily about you guys telling us what art play should be doing. And this certainly isn't about art place telling you guys what you should be doing. But I think it's about sort of figuring out what we need to get done and figuring out how we're going to do it. So that's my version of a sort of blessing and invocation. And with that, I'd love to sort of ask Maria, you know, you've sat through the same sessions that we've all sat through collectively. And you've had some thoughts. And I would just love to sort of, what are some of the things that have resonated with you? And what are some of the things that you would like to see us get done as a creative place-making community? So one of, one of the things that, that I heard over and over um, is under the big banner of connectivity. So there, there's a lot of energy around connecting, whether it's connecting to each other or connecting outside of a particular policy silo, uh, connecting places, whether it's physically linking up across or, or down the Mississippi, as somebody had, had suggested, or thinking about sister cities. I heard that come up uh, as an idea. So this notion of connectivity in, in many, many different manifestations seems to be really important. That got my attention. Um, because of what I did for so long around metrics and measurement, the question about measurement got my attention and how there is such an opportunity uh, to think creatively and expansively about what we intend to do when we set out to measure something and how we go about it, to think not only about quantitative information 
uh, but qualitative information as well, and not to dismiss it as only anecdotal, as if it's not as important, but to give it its heft uh, in the way that it deserves alongside uh, quantitative. I, I heard that. Um, and I, some, of, some of that is sort of similar when Professor Pastor was talking about ground truthing. Yes. That it's an important, right, it's not anecdote, it's actually a, a check. That's right, yeah. that's right. I mean, sometimes we call it a smell test. Mm -hmm. You know, does, does this smell right? When, when you have numbers uh, fed back to, to a group and they're asked to interpret it, uh, and people will say, does this seem like what's going on in the place that you're familiar with? Does this data tell you that? So there's a whole set of things that can be done around that. I think uh, when Don from Irvine had us do that uh, exercise where he asked how many people here think they're working in community development? How many people think they're in economic development? How many people think they're in the arts? It made me think about how uh, agile uh, people in this room are with switching hats. Uh, and being able to act effectively in different contexts. Uh, it's work that has to happen in order for creative placemaking to be, right? So you have to know how to uh, behave not only in the arts world, but also in community development, sometimes in social services, sometimes with transportation. And that there's a lot to be learned from people who have been able to do that over time and do it well. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunity for sharing about that kind of agility uh, and strategic thinking. There's a lot of that in the room that has to be harvested. So I think that's really important. Um, th so those are, so those are some initial things that, right. that come to mind for me. Uh, and I'm sure people come here with different prisms. So what got my attention may not be exactly the same thing that got somebody else's attention, but we'll yeah. hear that. In, in terms of the things Maria sketched out, folks find that fairly resonant, fairly relevant to what you're doing? Yes, hands? Yeah? Anyone who wants to wildly disagree with anything Maria just said? <laughs> okay. All right, so in terms of no. sort of, <laughs> in terms of sort of putting us into the right mind frame, um, are my sister city's friends here? There's one of them. Excellent. Can you guys, you, can we get a mic to both of these guys? And I just would love for you guys, don't, it's, it's all right, it's all good. Would you guys just sort of introduce yourselves and just talk to, talk to the group about the idea we talked about last night at, at, by the way, what actually was the best party I've ever been to in Los Angeles. So <laughs> I don't know party. if Nancy and um, Damon are here, but it was absolutely extraordinary. There's Nancy in the back. If everyone could give them a huge thank you once again. That's great. So in the middle of all this wonderful food and the fabulous Thai shadow puppets and the visual art and the jewelry and all of that, um, two people had a very interesting idea, which they brought to me. So I feel free to stand up, come sure. to the center, whatever you guys would like to do. Maybe uh, I'll come over there. All right, we can come together. I'm Angela Damiani. I'm with a group called Milwaukee, based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm Richard Young. I'm with the North Limestone Community Development Corporation in Lexington, Kentucky. So the idea is really simple, and that's that we want more of the, like, cross-pollination and the fellowship and the idea exchange that we've had in the last three days, and we want it over the length of the grant period. So what if when you got your notification saying that your grant or your idea is going to be funded and you had the specifications about the blogs you need to write and the reporting that needs to happen, you also were assigned to a sister city um, and it could be random, we haven't fleshed this out, or it could be because your projects have um, <coughs> sort of like discrepancies or similarities that would be really interesting to learn from. And then throughout your project, you have an opportunity to go and visit that city for a few days, really drill down into what the like successes are, what the challenges are, how you can, <laughs> how do you know this is the we best idea? We just have to idea? pause yeah. for that cell phone <laughs> ring. I, I hope it's an actual theremin, not just the cell phone. <laughs> Okay, all right, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> and we also talked about how, even if it wasn't people that are in the same grant funding cycle, but it could also be like someone that just got their grant versus someone that got their grant two years ago. So you could sort of compare, you know, the strengths and weaknesses of what you were doing. Right, 
I think that in a lot of ways we're all very fortunate to have had this experience. I know personally for me, I keep telling everyone, I'm so excited that there's 200 people in the room that know exactly what we're doing. <laughs> in, <laughs> in our communities, a lot of times we spend a significant amount of time just like advancing the vernacular and trying to explain what placemaking is. And I think we've all experimented with that in the last couple of days about what is the field going to be, how do we self-define, to be able to commune with someone who can like get past all of the defining and just get into some of the meat of like how do you build community, where does the economic development go after this project, um, how do we make it sustainable, it would just be an incredible value that only I think Art Place would be able to provide. It's totally separate from having a community partner even within your community. And not only that, I think it would provide a lot of emotional support for, <laughs> for everything that <laughs> happens throughout uh, your funding cycle. And finally, I think when we're talking about building a field, it'll have a really densely woven network then. You have other people across the country that you know very intimately, you know their projects, you know what the resources are nationally. And so it could be that third piece of the field building um, beyond having a digital platform and a once a year conference. Excellent. So let's do a couple of things. I think, let's, let's A, applaud. <laughs> Let's two for social media friends in the back. Let's capture that and throw up something on Facebook about creating pairs of grantees, creating an opportunity to travel and visit with each other, something like that. And then just, I mean, from the applause, it seems like folks feel this is generally a good thing to do. I'm seeing lots of nodding heads. I'm not seeing lots of shaking heads. So that, yeah, let's borrow back one of your mics. <laughs> Keep one up there. <laughs> All right, so some of us have already started to do that informally, okay? So Laura and Yun Lee came out to Cleveland and actually presented um, not only to our entire arts network, but also specifically to my merchants and my artists, um, and then provided us technical assistance just for kicks and giggles about um, something that we're, we launched kind of post our place, and I'm supposed to return the favor, but we haven't figured that out yet. But I, I don't suspect that, so it's a great idea. I love the, like, the formalizing of it, mm -hmm. but I suspect that we're not that special and that I'm sure if we surveyed people, we could find a bunch of little grassroots nexus models of that, like when, you know, what we did. Excellent. And we can capture that as kind of to percolate to then make it some you know, level of formality and learning lessons that we had from that engagement. Brilliant. Yes. Any other quick? Yes. yes. Let the, leave, the, leave them a mic up here just for the moment. Anything else quickly, and then we can move on to the next topic. But yeah, these guys over here. Sorry, I'm really making poor Polly run around today. She dressed for the walking tour, which you should all go on later. On occasion, when we have visitors like that, we also invite them, as the strangers from the outside, to speak to local funders and other organizations to talk about their experiences because people do tend to listen a little better about concrete projects from without. Great. And then was there someone right behind you who I think wanted to get in? Uh, hi. I was just going to say that there's a funding cohort here of, of um, the Diverse Art Spaces cohort within the Ford Foundation. And so for the last two years, um, we've been able to, with a modest travel funding, to do exactly that and go and visit our colleagues in other places. So. I'm Miami Light Project, we went to visit AS220 and La Mama and uh, Chen Dance Center through this very modest you know, support, but it was massive at the same time. Um, and then locally we have some access to grants where we can have a little you know, travel fund and then um, fly someplace to see somebody, but also we have some deals at hotels and it's Miami and we can host, you know, oh, you can come visit us there, and, you know, so <laughs> um, there is, I'm just sort of affirming what you said that this is, this network is, this is going on and absolutely we should do it more with Art Place folk. So this sort of set up perfectly what I thought was going to take a little longer to do. So I'm actually now going to turn with another question for you two and say if I were, if we were at Art Place able to identify a pilot pool of funds, would you guys be willing to show us how to set up something that captures this idea? So if we were, if we were able to make something available, say $50,000 in a travel fund, would you guys be able to figure out how we could set that up, how we could deploy it, how we can engage with the folks in this room and the folks who weren't able to? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Excellent. All right. All right. So I think we have our first actionable idea. 
I think that's fabulous. So I will be emailing with both of you guys afterwards. And literally, I don't know anything other than the conversations we've had. We've been able to identify a small amount of money as a pilot and then would love to sort of try this out and would love to sort of look for you guys to harvest the collective wisdom in this room Absolutely. to sort of do that. Yeah. Excellent, yes. fantastic. And just so you know, there is one person who's interested in creating a Mississippi River cohort of grantees. Yeah. So if you guys need someone to talk to about a regional idea, um, Sarah Hernandez, do you want to say a word about it or do you want to remain? Well, it's Hold on for one sec, let's just get a mic. Hello, I'm Sarah Hernandez with the McKnight Foundation in Minneapolis. So uh, the river starts in Minnesota, and of course, as you know, it goes through the middle of the country down to New Orleans. And um, after being involved in a number of funder affinity groups and having the opportunity to visit Memphis and New Orleans um, and meeting all the great creative placemaking individuals and organizations along the river cities, um, I was just overwhelmed by their creativity and their work and I thought how fabulous would it be if these creative placemakers could connect and share their ideas and experience each other's cities in, in ways that could only happen in person. And so um, just thinking about how we can make those connections and how we can bring people like Eric Robinson in Memphis up to Minneapolis to connect with people like Andy from NACTI um, and other creative placemakers in Minneapolis. So this whole idea of sister cities and connectivity, perhaps along a geographical um, entity like the Mississippi River is something to think about. That's great. How many people are... Huh. I hear a river cruise. That'd be great, Art Place. Well, right, Let's we'll, get a boat. Right, we'll fund it through gambling. <laughs> How many people are Mississippi River adjacent? Okay, excellent. But excellent. How many people are just river adjacent, period? Any river, any body of water, any river. Listen, everybody. It's just interesting to think about common land features what? and how that feeds into how we think of place, how we think of home and communities and how it connects to that, yeah. yeah so can I just oh yeah, please. So I work in the community development portion of the McKnight Foundation. Our arts program is also representative here. So part of our thinking is around economic development, regional development. And so development along the rivers and how rivers have influenced the development of cities are things that we think about. So that's the lens that I bring to this work. Good. And I won't say that Sarah is one of those people who didn't want to talk to me. She was very happy to talk to me. But she was not sort of involved in this work. She knew it as a nice thing that some of her colleagues did. Um, and I think you said to me this morning that you're going back a sort of advocate to incorporate more of this thinking into work. So anyway, we've got a convert. Yay. Hallelujah. <laughs> um, Polly, did we have someone in the back? Oh, great. So I, I, one of the things that I wanted to say is that it, it, there's lots of great energy in this room and, and that the Art Place grantees occupy obviously a special place within the whole constel constellation of creative placemaking. However, I'd like to take us back also to the very first day and, and the notion of the commons and, and looking for ways to expand the conversation, whether it be the, the pairing or the toolkit or all the things that have been talked about beyond the folks who are Art Place grantees or our town grantees or any other grantees to other folks who may be doing this work in more or less formal ways around the country. Because I think that level of synergy is what's going to build a movement, not just the 40 or 50 grantees here or in other cohorts, but as you start to link with other organizations around the country that are, that are also doing the work in different ways and unique ways um, and in similar ways. So I would encourage you to, to push your envelope beyond the, the in-group to widen who's in the in-group to include other folks who are doing the work around the country. Richard and Angela, you guys caught that? I was going to just say that really syncs up with the idea of delegate. Mm -hmm that came up earlier. I mean, delegate implies that there's some representation of something bigger, right. in a sense, and I think, I think that's a useful concept. And, and let me just add, so one of the many hats that I wear is actually working with the recovery community, addiction recovery, people in recovery. And, and I'm sorry, did you say which community you're Oh, I'm from in? Tucson, Arizona, not a grantee, but was a reviewer a couple of years ago. So the feds had this pilot initiative for like 15 years, so it was a little bit longer than the call the Recovery Community Services Program. Mm -hmm. Long story short, 
the peer-to-peer -peer recovery support services organize themselves into an association of recovery community organizations because those RCSP grantees who are in a very privileged pr position realized that, but they wanted to make sure they were able to seed peer-to-peer -peer recovery support and RCOs throughout the country. And so they realized they needed to reach outside the 50-some grantees that had been granted over those 15 years to try and ensure that every community had access to these tools and resources, and that's why they organized in the way they did outside of the grant program, the pilot program, to make sure that they were sharing information resources and what they learned in their three to five year grants. So I would just encourage that among this group as well. And then would you pass the mic? I think Laura wanted to get in. Hi, I'm Laura Zabel from Springboard. Uh, to that end, um, I just wanted to sort of put in a little plug, Springboard, some of you in this room have been really involved in this and have helped a lot, but Springboard's been working on a platform uh, to share stories and toolkits and resources of our programs, but also of other people's programs um, to try and create that exchange um, between communities, between practitioners, um, and, and for us, most importantly, between artists. Um, and we're gonna launch a little beta thing of that next week, and I would love input and help, and I feel like it's at this very early and very flexible stage where it can be what we want it to be and what feels useful and practical to the people in this room and the people that you work with in your own communities. So if I haven't already, I'll be reaching out to all of you about that. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Thanks. Hi, Cindy Ornstein, Mesa Art Center and Mesa Department of Arts and Culture. I have two things I wanted to say. The first one is on the uh, area of networking and connectivity. Um, something happened quite naturally the other day, a conversation that Tracy and I had after her talk about what's happening in Ajo. Um, she mentioned the desire to attract young people, and I was thinking about the fact that separate from our project, our art place project, we are also working on an art space project, and we um, are very excited about what she's doing in Ajo. So we talked about a creative exchange. Um, we're only two hours apart. Um, the idea of taking one week when I bring, my, our project involves a lot of young people that are only two hours from her and maybe have never been to Ajo. So bringing, bringing a group of, of young people and artists uh, from, from the Phoenix area down to spend some time seeing what she's doing and getting excited about it and then having a different week when we bring up artists from her community that enable, that can see what we're doing. I mean, we would learn about their live work project since we're planning one, and a lot of young people would be turned on to what they're doing in Ajo. And I think that kind of pairing that's very, very much built around need um, in, in your community would be very cool where if we had, a, um, as part of this exchange idea, if we ha could list things we desire that someone in another project can recognize as something they can bring to the table so that we're very strategic about these partnerings. Um, I think that could be very cool. As well as perhaps having the money for some creative exchanges would be amazing. I have a funder in mind for ours, but you know, that, that's something that could be very helpful. Um, the other thing I wanted to comment on was this question of field versus movement, and I've been thinking about it a lot. And I think, you know, somebody said, well, but a movement, um, a movement gets someplace and then is over. But, um, you know, that's not really true. A movement, I just recently completed after many years going back to school and getting my master's. I, I did my thesis on 20th century protest songs, so I spent a lot of time looking at movements. And, you know, a movement ch tries to change a norm. And I think that's what we're doing. And when I think about a field, one of the things that makes me anxious is I think about some of our stakeholder groups who are really excited about the work we're doing in Mesa and are, are, want to be part of it. And if I, was, if I were to think of it in terms of a field, they would feel excluded from that. They would feel that that was for the professionals, the administrators, the people who are um, staff. When I think about a movement, I, I can see that how well they fit into and can get really passionate about being part of a movement. And I think we're in a time when there aren't enough movements. And, and as someone who's been immersed in studying movements for the last five years doing my thesis, I, I want to say that we need a movement and we need this movement. We need a movement that brings together the people who want to change the way we have, uh, the way we build community. And the arts have an, a unique power to do that. And I think that there's something very, very important about thinking about what we're doing as a movement. 
But I want to also dispel the idea that a movement lacks rigor. I mean, it, that it has to lack this learning and this strategic focus and this, um, this sharing that we're talking about. Um, you know, the civil rights movement would never have been what it was if the Highlander Folk School wasn't there teaching um, a lot of people about how to use songs like We Shall Overcome and, and make it a singing movement that had power. I mean, there is a lot of rigor in the way people who form movements make them successful. And I want to I wanna just put my vote in for, for a movement here. So I think we've got, we've got someone on deck here and then there's someone over there. And just before we go, um, I, I think words are incredibly important. I've spent most of my career uh, involved with words in one way or another. I think this is a really important conversation to have. Um, I think what I have heard is, although we don't necessarily yet have consensus on what the right word is, I think there are some aspects of it that we all agree on, which is that we're a community of folks who has something in common, a way of working and thinking. We want to be a community that's open. We want to be open to different kinds of ways of working, different ideas, different knowledges. We do want something around which to organize ourselves. Um, so we want to be able to say that we are creative placemakers or something so that people know whether or not to show up to the meeting. So do you know what I mean? You know, it's sort of everyone in the world shouldn't show up because there'd be too many people for the ballroom at the Omni. Um, so we need something around which to organize ourselves. If there are other thoughts about those sort of aspect things, I think it'd be useful, those sort of attributes, I think it'd be useful to get on the table. And then in terms of the words we use, whether it's a field, whether it's a movement, whether it's a commons, um, I think, is Marcus here? Marcus was talking about a community of practice and maybe there's something around community that might be a useful word or something like that. I'd love to sort of pick that up. So maybe on Facebook, let's just capture um, what is the framework we should use to organize ourselves or, or something in that area um, to do that. So I just think that's important. So let's so go here and too. then. Yeah, well, let's go here and then, oh, well, and then we've got to go Damon after you. Uh, hi, I'm Andy Hesnes from the Native American Community Development Institute in Minneapolis. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about art place and this kind of new direction and how we're, we're thinking about, you know, these words and movement field and building. Um, and I really want to echo the comments about um, expanding the people who are in this room and how we um, can use this gathering as a platform to kind of accom uh, accomplish some of the other goals. Um, so I really started to think about what some of the other models were, and, and I've been to the Railvolution conference mm -hmm. a number of times, and I think that's a really interesting uh, approach where they've brought together really diverse skill sets, and, and if, I don't know if people are familiar with that uh, conference, but its uh, its tagline is something like building livable communities with transit. And I think a lot of what we're doing is building livable communities through creative placemaking or whatever term we're using. Um, and, and that conference has been going on for 20 some years um, and really bringing people together. So if we could start to create a national gathering where these ideas start to come together and, and we can still draw from different skill sets um, but use the opportunity of coming together um, to create that, that learning experience. And, and the other great thing about the revolution is it's really interested in those tours and the getting out into the field in those communities where the conference happens. So it's, it's very grounded in place. Um, that it's, it's not a perfect model, but I think it's something we could learn from. And they're really starting to transition from conference into movement themselves. So uh, interesting synergy, I think, between the two. Which is for rail. Yeah. Right, <laughs> movement. Yeah. Um, just as a quick straw poll, how many people have been to the Railvolution conference? So we do have some people, I see Eric in the back. Yeah, so we have Jason, oh, great. So we do, have, we do have delegates to and from Railvolution, which I think is great. So I think there's something to capture around um, making creative placemakers present in already established gatherings, mm -hmm. as well as what are the gatherings that we need to establish for ourselves that are sites for the sort of interdisciplinary work. I think, um, I think that in identifying the overlap Right? In, oh, yeah. If, if there's the idea of meeting year to year, um, a lot of times what I've seen is you have conferences that happen every year and people go away revved up about a theme and then it kind of dissipates. And then the next year they come back and they get revved up about another theme and it kind of dissipates. It would be really interesting to figure out how to track progress within this community. And I don't mean in a, in a hard, quantitative way necessarily, 
but just to be able to check in mm -hmm. and say, the project that I was working on two years ago, here's what it looks like now. Right. now that kind of progression, uh, where you're looking at indications of, of moving in the right direction yeah. and building the space for it right. within this community seems like it's a really interesting Excellent. Idea. So I know we've got a lot of hands, but I saw Damon in the back, and at this point, Damon gets to do whatever he wants. So <laughs> let's give the gentleman a microphone. <laughs> Peace family, how you all doing this morning? Good morning. Good to see you all up bright and early. Um, <laughs> first and foremost, I just want to say happy birthday to Carol Colette, Coletta. Coletta. The sister who was the Art Place um, ED last year. Her birthday's today, so happy birthday wherever you are in the world. And she's on Facebook, so you can also. Is she on Facebook? Facebook? So please quote that I said happy birthday today. I did first thing this morning. For sure, you have to hit Facebook. Um, so I. I'm really grateful to be a part of the conversation right now, and there's so many rich ideas coming up. I wish I could have heard more context from yesterday and, and Monday, but um, just around some language, I think, around like field or movement, I think Art Place in and of itself is a lifestyle brand. It's bigger than just a movement. It's bigger than just a field. It's something that's embedded in community because community lives this every day. Like it's a part of their everyday interactions with how they engage with space, with how they engage with people in space. So I think building, building this concept of, of community engagement on a person-to-person -person level, community leadership on a person-to-person -person level, and then having the organizational piece in the, in the mix. So there's like organizational engagement in the community, organizational leadership, and then this financial piece that's engaged in the community. And I'll give you an example. Esperanza has been really, really blessed this past year to work with so many institutions in LA, like the Music Center, for example. Um, they, had, they rolled out a project, Active Arts, to do things in the community, but they didn't necessarily have relationships in the community. So they leveraged their relationships with different organizations, but what we found out that community members didn't like that type of approach because it was more so outside looking in, we're gonna bring you what we think is a good idea, and the community didn't respond as such. They were more excited about the process because every single day they live this process in this conversation. So I think getting more embedded in the lifestyle, the culture of what it means to activate space in time is, is bigger than just a movement or, um, or a field. And you know, I, I love the idea of collaboration, like, figuring out mechanisms that we can all stay in touch with one another, share ideas, share inspiration, share theories, but also sharing our, our best practices um, is, is something that's key. Uh, I think that's all I got for right now. Cool. I think that's great. It's a lifestyle brand. And I think, and I, I could even suggest we might want to even push it one tick further, which is I'm of an age where I grew up being told that I had a lifestyle, and my lived experience was that I had a life. So it may even be beyond a lifestyle brand, it may be our life. Totally. I mean, look at hip hop, for example. You know, it's not just a movement. This is something that is embedded globally, and it's embedded from corporate America all the way down to the person in their mom's garage making music. You know what I mean? So it's, it became something that our culture has imparted or embedded in their life, everyday practice. So our place, get into the lifestyle. Excellent. Um, do we have a, does someone have a mic? Polly is pointing. Um, first, I just second the comments made about movement. I think that's, those are great. Um, I think one of the other things that is characteristic of a movement is that a lot of stuff may happen organically and on its own. And I think one of the things that would be really helpful <coughs> uh, would be to continue to identify folks that aren't grantees that are doing this, even if they're not calling this kind of work creative placemaking, and figuring out how to connect them to what we're doing so we can both learn from them and communicate with them. I think that idea of of are also going to the entities that are out there doing community building in different ways, whether it's um, the bid community, CD, uh, community development corporations, American Planning Association, uh, Urban Land Institute, these entities that have gatherings and making sure that there's a creative placemaking conversation there. And that's also one of the ways where we'll find out, oh, somebody over here has been doing this, they're not calling it that, but they're interested and there's a connection and then they become part of the community. <clears throat> and I think one of the other reasons that connecting to some of those entities, like the CDCs or nonprofit housing entities, is important is because um, sustainability. You know, 
we go and we get a grant from you guys, but then how do we find the, the institutional partners to have the sustainability and support to keep going? Uh, and, and I think one other point related to that is because to be able to go back to former Art Place grantees um, and have at least some of them, you know, coming back three years, five years, being part of a conversation, so you get some sense of the continuity of, of issues and a little bit of a historical memory about these conversations as well. So I heard two ideas in that. Um, one was a sort of amen to the real evolution idea about sort of infiltrating other conferences. And then the second idea was figuring out who doesn't yet have delegates in the room. Who are the people who aren't represented in the room who need to be. So let's capture that second one about sort of how do we identify the people who need to be represented in the conversation because they're doing the work or because they're from a network of institutions or something like that. Was it Julia? Great. Yeah. And then we'll come right here. To Thank Michael. you. Uh, <clears throat> Julia Taylor from Milwaukee. I just wanted to build on, on the st uh, stream of thought because I saw the impact that the Bloomberg Awards had on our mayor and the way he looked at it, community engagement. Uh, and I think the ability to bring people with us who could be influential and, and creative. Julie, just so folks can follow along, will you just say a word about what that is in case folks don't know what the Bloomberg sure. Awards Sure, there was were. an award put out for the top five cities to come up with ideas that could be transformative for the city. And our mayor actually used a whole pitch and challenge approach to the community to bring the idea forward and then to continue to inform it. And even though we didn't win the challenge, that project's moving forward in our community. And it's really changed the way he looks at this whole engagement component. And I think, uh, you know, uh, I'd love to bring our mayor, Tom Barrett, to an event like this. Or if we thought about people that we need to have influenced by the creative placemaking movement in our communities that could help us carry the work forward, to have them be a part of this type of gathering, I think could be transformative in many ways. And I think also to follow up on your idea about going out to the other groups, you think about the National League of Cities or the US Conference of Mayors. Be great to have some symposiums there on creative placemaking mm -hmm. and start to call out some of those civic leaders that are moving this whole idea forward. Excellent. So I heard, I think, three things in that. I heard an amen to the idea of continuing to stay in touch and continuing to see former grantees as part of the community. I heard an amen to the idea of reaching out to folks who either became finalists but didn't become grantees or even those who didn't even become finalists because there's a lot of great work happening in that project, in those projects as well. And I heard an amen to making sure we get new people into the room. But there was also building champions, I think. Yes. Right, so the whole idea of getting elected officials and other gatekeepers, in a sense. Yeah, so let's, cap so building champion champions, I think, is a new one. So let's capture that. Yeah. Michael. Um, I, I really like this conversation around um, partnerships and travel. I was one of the groups when you said, raise your hand if you have a big travel budget. I couldn't raise my hand. So the idea that there could be more resources <laughs> is, is wonderful. And, and I just met Sarah over breakfast, and she told me about this raft that went from Minneapolis to New Orleans, and this arts group made it. Um, and I thought, well, that's hard. I don't have time to make a raft. And I started thinking about the Macaw tribe on the uh, Washington coast that does this amazing endurance canoe trip to visit other tribes. And if, if we want to do more connections, maybe there's a, a central funding there about maybe Art Place or McKnight should uh, fund a raft that then anyone can use to take down the Mississippi <laughs> River and then send it back up and use it again. And, and there's, there might be, it's good branding for you guys too. Um, so the idea I think is the USS Art Place, right? Excellent. So I think capturing something about, and I think there's both a physical idea there as well as a sort of possibly a virtual idea. So I think raft is in some ways a kind of placeholder, but are there ways that we can physically connect each other, us as a community, and then what are the virtual ways? So I think there's something around that connectivity. Yeah. Um, so I really like that raft idea. Polly, whoever you're, I can't see who you're standing next okay. to. Okay, oh, so uh, Megan and I were just having a conversation about how many artists are actually here at the convening. So it would be helpful for me just to know visually if they could raise their hand. How many and people self-identify as an artist? Cool, because we were thinking more art artists should be here, but I don't know how many that is out of the whole group. Yeah, no, so I think th this is an interesting kind of question, because I've heard that, right? Where, why aren't there artists here? Why aren't there artists here? Raise your hands again. Why aren't there artists here? So no, so say more about that. Or anyone. I, I, heard, I heard some murmurings. Yeah. It wasn't clear. People 
necessarily, right. at least in my experience here, self-identifies as artists, and so obviously artists are people that aren't going to be tangled. Right. So it would be nice to just talk about that a little bit. So I think just one thing, just there's in every sort of funding philanthropy conversation I've been to, there's always the sort of failure conversation throughout. Um, I think one big art place failure that I will tell on ourselves is, I don't think we've done a very good job as an organization of identifying all of you guys to each other. I don't think we've sort of introduced you to each other before you got into this room. I don't know that we've shared contact information or you know whatever the kids do instead of list serves now um, or any of it. What, what do they do? Snapchat? I don't know. What do we? Or what WhatsApp? Or whatever that is, um, but I think, but that is, and I'm saying, and just you know, because this is all about sort of modeling good behavior. How many representatives from our place foundations are in the room? Just raise your hands, my foundation colleagues. So in front of my foundation colleagues, I am saying flat-footedly that Art Place has done a lousy job at doing that, and so that's something that we need to learn from and iterate. So. It's interesting that folks said, I wasn't aware that there were that many self-identified artists in the room. And I'm not saying that's enough, I'm not saying that's too few, I'm not saying that's too many. I didn't, we didn't help you guys have the information you needed to have to do that. So I think there's something we need to capture around the idea of sort of making sure we all know who's already, before we even get to sort of inviting other people into our community, I think we need to make sure our community knows each other and knows each other by the multiple subject positions. I'm a transit-oriented development project, I'm near a river, I'm led, you know, a project that's led by an artist, whatever else. So this is, I think, a failure that I think we need to address on that. So I've lost track, I'm relying on the mics. There's one Polly's there. pointing, so let's go to Polly and then, oh, and then, uh, sorry, I've been ignoring House Right. Uh, my name is Bob Barza, I'm Modesto Art Museum, Modesto, California, and I have to say being here is going to change the way that I write my blog every month because I never had an audience before and whether or not you read my blog, I'm now going to be writing it as if you will be reading the blog. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have read some of your blogs, one or two here and there from month to month, but there are some that I'm going to make a point because I've met you and I'm, I'm excited about what you're doing and I'm going to read your blog. And as I travel around mostly Western United States for other reasons to see family or friends, I'm going to look up to see if there is, going to, if there is an art place uh, grantee anywhere near where I'm going to be traveling. And, and you might hear from me because I might want to go out for coffee with you to hear how you're doing and what you're doing and, and, and whether or not we get money to travel to a sister city. If I'm in your city, I'm, I'm going to come to your play or go to your art center or whatever it is that you're doing and I'm going to look for that. And, um, and we you're have, also going to welcome people to Modesto. Oh my gosh, yes, that's, that's on my list. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and if you come anywhere near Modesto, California, you're very, very welcome uh, to look me up and, and I'll have more than coffee with you. I'll, I'll give you a tour of the entire city. Uh, and then uh, we have one, Modesto has had two projects. Uh, Jessica had the Building Imagination Center, and we didn't wait for our art place to put us together. We have been very, very much involved. We have partnered with each other, and she's been much involved in our project, and we have been much involved with her project. So, um, we just, it, the sister city thing could be more than just getting together to meet, but we can actually build, help build each other's projects. So. I'm seeing nods from our two sister cities leads. All right, so we see a lot of hands. We want to get to everyone. So I know this is incredibly dorky. This is what Marie and I were just whispering about. But in so that we sort of get to everyone, would you guys hate us if we suggested that we sort of set up three lines so that we can get to everyone in the sort of half hour we have remaining? So if, you, so if you'd like to, so can yeah. we, we'll go to this mic, and then if anyone wants to speak, feel free to come either behind Liz or Polly if you would come to the front and come behind Polly. And I know it's awkward and it's awful, but we've got about 30 minutes or so left, and I want to hear from as many people as right. possible. So I just want to give everyone a chance to speak. So let's start here, and then we'll just take one, two, three, and keep going that way. So, okay, so it's like city council kind of model. Yeah. This is, okay. yeah. Right, this has now become Parks and Rec. <laughs> I get to be Amy Kohler. So you know, this is, uh, you know it's so crazy, so I, I was just gonna, so, an observation that's interesting is, 
I do this socially engaged art stuff. We have this conference called the Creative Time Summit with artists that are really engaged in community from around the world. And there's a whole scene of it, I would say. But what's weird to me that I just got to get my finger in is a lot of them aren't here. But that's, I'm not saying it's bad news. It's, it's super interesting because I don't know a lot of you, but I go to a lot of art stuff with, you know, amazing practice from artists that are doing stuff in this kind of vernacular, I would say. So that is to say the community can get bigger, which is good news. But also I'm so perplexed ethnographically of our own field about the gap. You know, how is that happening? Because like some of the most sick work in the world is happening in this field. And they're not in this room. And I know also from having conversations with these folks, there's a lot of um, frustration that, like Rick Lowe, he's like, how am I not getting an Art Place grant? This is insane. So there's a really easy answer to this, which I'll tell only because Rick and I were just emailing. Yeah, okay. The big driver of that is yeah. the fact that he didn't apply. <laughs> so now, I told that on a funny story. I don't know if Rick, I don't know if Rick is watching and I don't know um, if his executive director is watching, but Art Place is three years old. And particularly in the first year and second year, we were figuring out who we were, we were figuring out how to apply. So I did this as a funny thing to get your attention, but there's a serious point to be made, which is there are folks who applied in the first year and the second year who sort of said, well, forget it. Yeah. Right, I'm not gonna do it, I'm gonna opt out. So this is a sort of, I wanna say publicly that this is an opportunity to be welcomed back in. Now having said that, I wanna be really serious about the numbers. We received 1,300 letters of intent, we made 97 finalists, and we're probably gonna make something around 40 or 50 grants. So the odds aren't great, right? When I was at the National Endowment for the Arts, 50% of the applications we receive get funded. One in two gets funded at the National Endowment for the Arts. 50 out of 1,300 get funded at Art Place. So it ain't easy, but you know, the only way to win it is to be in it. So that's a, so I just I want to make both of those points very. But seriously. if I could also just just to be proactive on this note because I think it's a real opportunity when we're saying about the artists in the room and stuff, you know maybe there's a space in in art place even if they don't get grants that at this convening you could bring in some of these artists that are doing because it'd be nice to just hear some specific practices mm -hmm. at the beginning of the day to get your juices going and to really get in the like the magic of arts because mm -hmm. it really helps. You can see it and feel it. So maybe they don't have to necessarily get a grant, but just to build the community with artists, I think would help too. Fantastic. All right, let's go to Barnaby. Uh, yes, applaud, applaud, applaud. Just it's to like echo. liking on Facebook, but in real life. Well, and, and echo what NATO was saying, it's, it's sort of walking the walk also to have art inform our community here. But there was another idea that came up in the conversation here that when you were mining out of it, I, I got skipped over, which I thought was really important, which is this idea of infiltrating this idea of uh, creative placemaking into the existing fora of community building, of uh, associations of planners, foundations, and things like that, because I think there's an opportunity there that in field building, and I, I like the idea of movement, because it's action and accomplishment, but this getting this movement out there is articulating the goals and giving examples of great practice in those fora, because they have existing professional relationships. And that was mentioned there. I just wanted to make sure that, that was considered. Excellent. Thank you, Barnaby. Um, so I think to build on what Barnaby was saying and, and, and NATO, uh, Sherry Dobbin, I'm with Times Square Arts. And to bring back this point of artists. So, you know, we may identify as an artist, but are we listing ourselves under artist fees, for example, when we put our grant? So I think part of the question about artists at the tables is making sure that the artists and the projects are involved. But um, when I worked in theater and we held talk back sessions, what's the first question everybody asks actors? How did you learn all those lines? So one of the first questions I'm always asked is, how do you find your artists? So NATO is talking about Creative Time Summit. Creative Capital is a grant making agency that has a lot of artists who are exploring ideas, but we need to start building that sort of sector and that practice also within the arts. And we also need to start connecting to it. And it's another reason why each of us then who identify as artists should be involved in as many other activities with artists networks so that we can start to find those artists and mentor them and build them and also be able to share them. So we might want to look at a platform or a way in all of our social media 
that we're also either advertising the opportunities or artists are able to post like bios about themselves or a simple link or something like that. But everybody here, if we're more successful, we're gonna need more artists who work in this way. And we all know that not every artist can go into every situation. You need to find the right match. So I just wanna say that individually, you can start to do more networks. Every time I do something for like Curate NYC or whatever, I always try and find one artist who works in that way or another sort of platform so that it raises the attention. So if we all do that and then we all find a way that we can start to share our networks, then we'll, we'll have better artists to call upon. Did you want to jump in? No, I think that's a really good idea and, and uh, to have examples of the kind of work that artists can do. I, in my own work, um, one of the biggest hurdles in trying to you know, infiltrate other systems, if you, if you will, is that there's a really limited understanding of what artists do. Mm -hmm and the kinds of relationships that they have to place and that they have to people. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly getting an expansive notion of how artists contribute and what they do make and how they connect is really important just for the infiltration uh, strategy, if you will. Um, there is a weird branding thing at play. I, I'm going to get the numbers wrong, so if there's anyone here from USA Artists, I apologize in advance. But there was that project that Holly Sitford did that led to the establishment of that that something like 97% of Americans appreciated having art in their lives, 30% appreciated having artists. That was the Urban Institute. Was that the Urban Institute? Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm quoting no, Maria was, in front no, of Maria. Was, <laughs> Holly was, Holly was so involved. So do it correctly, do it correctly. Holly, Holly was involved too. Holly was a key, key player in it. But it was the Urban Institute study on investing in creativity is a study of the support structure for US artists, and it was that, right. that there was this high appreciation for what artists make, but there was very little appreciation for the artist as a professional or as a contributor to society. So there was this odd disconnection, right? right? People didn't understand that people actually created these things that had this great value. And the tagline, I think, that developed out of that was art comes from artists which to everyone in this room is sort of duh, but to 60% of Americans was a revelation. Hi, Jody Farrell from the Adrian R. Center for the Performing Arts in Miami. Um, whether it's a movement or a field, one thing that uh, I came away with was a long list of books and magazine articles and things that I really want to read based on what people have talked about. And it became clear to me that there are a lot of great minds who have written about this and researched on this in the past 20 years and I'd love to see a bookshelf or a recommended reading exchange between people and grantees on what they found particularly insightful or informative, whether it was 20 years ago or yesterday. Um, I know that it is somewhat in the insight section on the website, but you know, something more specific where, you know, before Amazon.com creates a bookshelf for it. <laughs> so uh, just three quick things. Let's capture something around that notion of a bookshelf or a reading list. Um, I forgot to say, let's capture something around that idea of self-identifying artists as professionals um, and in a self-evident way. And then three, on the to-do list for Art Place is I think we need to do a rethink of our website and in some ways make it more useful to the people in this room but also the people not in this room and so that in addition to doing the great job of broadcasting out information about all of your projects, we also turn it into a site for conversation and exchange, and you shouldn't have to be a grantee to get something out of the website. So we'll be looking for ideas and thoughts about Art Place's website soon. Anita. Hi, I'm Anita Contini um, with Bloomberg Philanthropy as a funder and actually past performer, past nonprofit arts group uh, organizer. So um, first of all, I just want to say I finally understand LA. <laughs> I, I've been here, I have family here, but I think last night and the night before, I really understood what was behind LA and the, actually the most wonderful part of what this city is about. So in that regard, I hope that the next time we all meet, we either get to a rural area or we meet in a city that is not one of the big cities, but one of the other cities that are doing some really important work. So I'd like to put that on the table. Sorry, Jamie, but I hope- No, 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 I love that. And so he, here's where we model good behavior. So I need help figuring out how to do that. So of my rural yes. people in the room, are there folks who have the capacity and interest in potentially hosting an art place convening? Not paying for, but hosting. Okay. Great. All right, so I think some sort of art place slash creative place making convenient, uh, convening in a rural setting is an important idea for us Great. to talk about. The other thing is that as a funder, I just want to say it has been so inspiring to meet so many of you. I wish I could have met and talked to every single one of you because uh, 
and I do read the blog, so I should let you know that. Um, but I'd like to say that, Jamie, I think you have a big job to get the best possible uh, communications marketing person on staff very, very fast. And I think it's the best job, not the worst job. <laughs> <laughs> because what great stories you have out there. And I think that's one way we not only tell each other what's going on, but the whole political arena that makes some very uh, important decisions that affect us. And we need to have those voices out there. Uh, because the stories are what is going to uh, really communicate the, the breadth and wealth of what's going on here. So I just want to say thank you to all of you, because um, I won't be here for the rest of the day, but I just want to say this is really a pleasure. I'm so proud that we're part of this. I know all of our funders feel the same way, so thank you. That's great. So, I, yay. So I think let's capture something around that notion of sort of capturing and disseminating stories in a more strategic way. Um, because I think we do a great job of we sort of opened up a fire hose of information with your blog posts And I think we might want to move towards a laser model or something. Leslie. Hey, uh, Leslie Koch from Governor's Island um, A little bit picking up on Anita, but I'm sort of transfixed by this pro studying protest songs and and how that relates to gay marriage and where we should be going so just which is what what are movements about they're about changing the public conversation what is the movement that has had the most incredible impact in my lifetime is the conversation about gay marriage. 15 years ago, my friends were gay activists. It wasn't even on the table. It is now normal, beyond normal, whether or not your state has gay marriage. And how did that happen? It, became, it changed the public conversation. And I think what we want to do, what's, where, where's the public, right? So you know, I, I don't think a ULI conference changes the conversation. And it's not just about stories, it's about how do you create a public narrative about the work that's happening here, about the work that could be happening, um, and encourage that, because that's how change happens. Politicians listen to the people, mm -hmm. um, and when people in sort their of. communities, what? Sort of. They do. <laughs> <laughs> I work for the mayor of the city of New York, um, and I used to work for the governor as well. And um, if we had waited for the leaders to say, take this crappy, you know, abandoned island, we went to the people and we made it a creative place um, and we welcomed them. But I think more fundamentally, I, I learn a lot from watching what happened in gay marriage and how you change a public conversation. And I think we should all be thinking about how do we change the public conversation about the role of culture in every public space, in every aspect of life. And yes, that's a media strategy, but it's also a really embracing political public conversation strategy. So I think, yeah, I, I think change, changing the public discourse or changing the public conversation, let's capture that as sort of a placeholder. And then number two, let's get gay married. <laughs> um, hello, everybody. My name is Marcus Young with Public Art St. Paul. I think this uh, conference has done a great job in making me feel very connected to you. I see, you know, my um, Asian brothers and sisters here. I see my gay brothers and sisters here. I see my Minnesotan brothers and sis sisters here. But again, going back, and yes, and South Dakota, sorry, Colleen, and North Dakota, <laughs> <laughs> and so Fargo. And so, but um, oddly enough, back to the previous uh, topic, I don't see my artist self reflected back at me. And I've just been thinking and thinking, and thank you to, to Roberta for making me think harder about this, Roberta Uno, because um, it's a little bit like what I learned in college where a friend would come up to me and say, I'm really sad about such and such. And I would say, oh, you gotta do this, you gotta do that, this is how you gotta, you know. And she said, no, I just need you to listen to me. Okay, so there's something about that, and what I mean, I think what I mean by this is that, you know, spending years and years of trying to figure out my own artist practice and how to think and, and work like an artist and protecting that space, and then to come into this arena and say, oh, I see, they're asking me to think and work differently which is a nice challenge, but at the same time, I'm still like protecting my own way that I've figured out all these years. So uh, at, at the same time, I, I, wanna, I wonder, like, okay, so are the community development folks, those brothers and sisters, are they also feeling that I, I've protected my way of thinking and working for so long, this is now my opportunity to join a movement? And why I resist the word movement for me personally is that um, I don't feel a part of that movement right now. I feel a part of the marriage equality movement, but not this movement. But the, the term communities of practice or community of practice says it's multidisciplinary. So it's not just about community development, but it's also about art. And so maybe I could be part of a community of practice for now as we figure out what the right term is. So I just am curious about artists who don't feel part of this movement or artists who don't feel um, that they're 
they're being asked to translate what they do into another space and way of working. And is there some energy and power in how um, others who are not artists or don't self-identify as artists say, this is my home, and how can that home or that belonging be just shifted or broadened a little bit more? I think that's great. And so I think there's sort of three things in that. One is that I think we need to make sure the artists who are in the room, figuratively, feel heard, feel present, and sort of are in their artist self as they're in this room. I think we need to make sure that we're open and welcoming um, to artists who would like to join this. Um, sort of when Manuel was talking about sort of cultural displacement um, and only having the signs in Echo Park in English. You know, we need to make sure that artists feel welcome. Um, and then we also, I think, need to be explicit that not every artist should work this way. So I think the third thing should be, it, it, that needs to be okay too. It needs to not be that you either need to work this way or you're wrong. So I think all three of those things are really powerful things that I heard in what you just said, so thank you. There's something about stretching and connecting. Yeah. That, that if there's a, an environment that's conducive to taking the risk to stretch right. and connect, that that's an important space, that's an important kind of a context to create. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Nancy. Hi, I'm Nancy from the Prattsville Art Center, and um, this all is really exactly what I'm trying to think about how to say. Um, I, I kind of want to try and address the question of why people like art but not artists, and I think it's because um, artists go through a very difficult and kind of often negative process in trying to question things and critically um, explore before they make that thing. And often the thing isn't liked in the beginning, but later there is a time of acceptance where now everybody thinks Impressionism is great, but at the time nobody liked it. I, I think that um, I've been a sponge here. I mean, I'm basically just an artist. This is like one of the first grants I ever wrote. But I was compelled to become involved with my project because of the, the storm that took place and because I saw a need in the community. Um, I, I like learning everything I'm learning here. This is incredible for me. I mean, I will never you know, go back to being the ignorant person I was. But at the same time, I think art place could be more selfish about what you could take from artists. Because it's, it's not only that artists should be recognized as professionals, because I think the kind of art that, that artists make that's innovative and different and truly challenging is often just so um, exploratory and different. And if art place wants to support projects which are truly different and innovative, we might need to think about how can we selfishly um, bring in people who don't necessarily think of professionalization as, an, as a goal. Mm -hmm. People who want to actually um, think differently, you know? I mean, it worked for Macintosh. You know, maybe it could work for us. And I think, you know, because the world is changing so much, artists really do have something to offer with that different kind of thinking. But that's a very different uh, approach than the kind of uh, quantitative and qualitative analysis approach that we've been taking. And I wonder how could we synthesize that? How could we actually bring in the gains from the, the sort of eccentricity and difference and experimentation that artists know how to do? Yeah, no, and I think, again, that's so resonant from what um, Professor Pastor was saying about, you know, we need to act as if the other is in the room. Um, always, because we need to make that space so that the other can come in the room, the eccentric, the whatever right. else. I think but that's But I mean, a really powerful in a way, uh, I don't know, Douglas Crimp used to say, you know, as a gay man, the thing I, I least want is tolerance. Mm -hmm. What I want is, you know, like, just be, you know, just be mad, even, just hate me. But I don't want to be simply accepted. And I think um, to say that there are others and othering I think is something that might be actually more divisive than it needs to be. I think actually we all share a kind of insecurity at a gut level, and artists are the ones who can make that public. Yeah. Art is the place where the inside comes out, yeah. and it's not always easy or pretty, yeah. um, and maybe that's not what we want to show to the governor or the mayor or the president, but I think it could inform the, the veracity and the viscerality and the relevance of the projects that we do. Nancy, thank you so much. Boston. Good morning. 
Good My morning. name is Boston Christopher. I'm from Alaska Perseverance Theater. I have five quick points. One, this is the second day in a row that Jamie has made me get up before double digits. So for playing Parks and Rec, I'm Ron Swanson. <laughs> Liz won the start at 8.30, <laughs> in my defense. Two, um, had a great conversation with a colleague of mine from Alaska uh, about the idea that maybe every project doesn't need to be sustainable, and that might be able to open up projects to other art place grantees down the line or thinking about your projects in a different way. Three, my point the other day about professional development, this is really why I'm standing at the microphone. But I think that every art place grant should come automagically with funds for an intern and or a mentee um, to work alongside the, the grant recipient. Just a quick question. How many of you guys included that in project budgets when you applied to art place? I see one hand. I see half a hand. I think it should be automatically included and not have to be in the budget. That well, you submit. So how would I pay for it if it's? I mean, no, no. But this is a serious thing. No, I think and it this should goes be. Back uh, to the Rick Lowe point. If yeah. You don't ask, I can't give. No, but I think it should just be part of what you do. That's what I'm saying. It should come with. If you get a grant from Art Place, you get an additional twenty-five thousand dollars for a mentee. That's automatic. Great. Yeah. Um, for. And uh, everyone wants this, right? A hundred percent of the people in the room want to take on a mentee. No. 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 Oh. Okay. Yeah. I'm not saying I'm right. Um, no, no, no. No, but I think no, the, the only thing I'm pushing back on is the automatic. I yeah. think the idea is really important. Mm -hmm. And again, this is about making people feel welcome and giving people the space to say, if I want to include a mentee, if yeah. I want to include an intern, if I want to include a staff person right. in my project budget, I can. So this, if we can capture something around that notion yeah. of making that feel welcome in the project. Point four, I just want to say that I thought this venue was very wonderful and that always looking for venues that provide opportunity for outside of conference time uh, networking and I thought that patio upstairs was perfect day and night so thank you for that whoever thank did you, that Liz Crane. and finally point five does everyone have the same urge I do to always throw the mic down when you're done yes. <laughs> I think that's great um, my name is Letitia Ivins. I'm from Los Angeles, the Los Angeles County Arts Commission. And this conversation has really given me an opportunity to think about how I proselytize. And I'm somebody, if anybody has encountered me over the course of this conference, I'm kind of pushy. I'm kind of aggressive. Like with the dancing last night, I arrived at 9 o'clock and I was like, why isn't there dancing? Get on the dance floor. You know, but so I have to temper myself. And I think with this idea of, you know, infiltration, cross-pollination, um, worthy investments, but I also think that the way that I'm able to shift the minds of other departments and politicians is by just being demonstrative and doing really kick-ass work and having deliverables at the end of the day that are really translatable to what they need to, po to that can inform policy change, that can inform master planning for the long run. And just an example, one project that we just completed, um, we worked with an artist who fortunately, we hired him because what we were looking for to do with him, the way we were hoping to instrumentalize him, was very much in keeping with his natural practice, Rostin Wu. And what he delivered among many other things was this book that made a pretty unsexy cultural asset mapping project that was funded, thank you NEA, um, through the first Our Town grant, um, really, really appealing. And now the Department of Regional Planning, Public Works, Parks, they want Rostin at the table. They don't care about me. They want, Rostin is like a god to them. Whereas before, this idea of, okay, we're, you're bringing an artist, okay, do that over there. And we'll see what you come up with, you know, but now the, the conversation has really shifted. And so I think it's important to be careful about what to NATO's point the other day was kind of overcompensating um, and, and really being listeners and hearing what the needs are and it making sure that you're staying strong to your artistic integrity, but also really dovetailing um, with kind of the larger agenda of your municipality or your community. I think that's great. And in that, I, I, I heard your main point and amen to that. I also heard public works, which is a theme that I've heard come up, and where's my public works colleague? So we have an idea about sort of infiltrating the public works national convention and making sure that these ideas get into it. And where are my Bunnell Art Center Homer colleagues? Are they here? Are they up? 
Oh, they just ran out because uh, they were terrified it was going to point to them. Anyway, there's some fabulous public works projects that are happening up in Homer, Alaska as well. So just in terms of making some connection on that basis, I want to do that. John. Thanks. Uh, John Davis, uh, Director of Lanesboro Arts Center, Lanesboro, Minnesota, population 750. A uh, couple comments. Uh, one quickly on field uh, movement. I, I don't think the two necessarily are mutually exclusive, so it's not an either or. I, I think uh, the speaker yesterday that talked about strategy and Tai Chi with these huge ideas uh, of just being strategic about it. So I mean, I, I think creative placemaking can be a, a field and there's a, a kind of an academic vernacular that might go with that. Uh, art place, I, I think, is becoming a movement and an organization. Uh, so just comment there. And just before you leave that comment, yesterday in a session you talked about how sometimes you use different people to talk to different audiences and different languages to talk to different audiences. So would you just do a version of that as well? Because I think it's related to this. Uh, yes, I mean, if you're talking with a, a city councilman, you're, you're going to have a different uh, language than perhaps talking with uh, a colleague at an arts conference. And I think if we're talking about creative placemaking or this kind of urgent work, uh, say at you know at a planning conference or just at a smart growth conference, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to just learn different languages of how other people are basically talking about the exact same thing, but they're using a different language. So just being strategic about that can really help promote this whole concept on a broader national scale, which is the essence of a movement. So I, I think there's Thank a lot you. of overlap. Thank you. Uh, another just a comment and just hearing uh, stories and getting to meet just uh, a few people from urban projects and urban areas, I think that there are uh, unique strategies and philosophies uh, from small town projects uh, and rural projects that overlap amazingly with urban neighborhood projects and, and vice versa. Also there are unique aspects about urban projects that would be really applicable to small towns and vice versa. So from funders in the audience, I think there's a real opportunity for this unique connection between the two and don't don't forget about that so for sister cities maybe not necessarily just like to like correct I, I think there's opportunity there um, let's see third oh just as a maybe check-in thing for the next uh, our place conference or even after this one of the most amazing exercises was that needs and haves uh, if organizations before they came here just what are your four haves? And then what are your four needs? And then other people could sort of look at that and then kind of match and say, oh, I've got this, I could help you, or you know, it's just a way to connect. And maybe even after that, we could I do that. I think that's great. Sarah, can we capture something around that formalizing that have and need? Because I was fascinated in reading the Twitter feed that for probably 80% of the needs, someone else was listing them as a have. Right. And that, I mean, that sort of shopping in our own closet and figuring out what the abundance, right, what is the abundance we already have? Let's make cheese, let's not make rot. And, and just talking with, with Nancy about something like frack mining, right. rural, urban. I mean, we had a great conversation about that and some of the strategies we both used. So, great. John, thank you so much. Janet. Yeah, thank you. I'm Janet Kagan. I'm with Art Force in North Carolina. My comments are five, and they're a little out of sequence. But um, for those of us who have been doing this for some time, hold on, can everyone hear her? No. Oh, no. Try again. Try it again? Yes, Is perfect. Better? Okay. Closer, closer. Yeah. Oh, even better. I'm Janet Kagan. I'm with Art Force in North Carolina. For those of us who have been doing this for some time, there are a multitude of organizations that exist at a national level, and um, they're all resources. Not that infiltrating them with this agenda is not important. In North Carolina, we have something called the Institute for Emerging Issues. They've tackled creativity big time. Um, and it's fabulous. What they've been able to do is successfully connect future networks for all the attendees so that they actually live on. The same is true with artists who have a, an opportunity to register through CAFE. Um, there are other local artist registries that exist for people. So maybe there would be an opportunity for a bibliography, a bookshelf, whatever it is that gets placed, but somehow listing all yep. those existing organizations. Um, a second piece of that, I think, that would be at least helpful for people like me, is that there be better descriptions, and this goes into the communications piece, of each of the grantees. So it's not just a sentence as to what got funded, but maybe it's a paragraph, and it lists all the project partners. 
Because by me knowing that there's somebody else in the CDC working in another community, I think that would be very helpful. And potentially to track the longitudinal impact of this, every year, every project for the next seven years has to come back with a one-page, two-page white paper of progress, what's happened, where did it go, um, what, are those, what are those longer impacts that I think would inform all of us working. I think, Sarah, can we just make sure we capture something around um, doing a better job with uh, capturing descriptions of the projects and the project partners? And this is actually, I would love your thinking on this too, Janet. What's fascinating to me and what I'd love to figure out a way to do is if we showed you how people describe their own projects, particularly in the LOI or application, there's a wild variation in terms of how good people are at doing that. And I don't think people necessarily understand, and we haven't done a good job of communicating this, that the way you title your project, your one sentence description, and your paragraph description are how people know it. When you're reading 1300 LOIs, that's your shot to get it right. So I think there's an exchange. I think our place and the grantee community and the applicant community all needs to work together on that. Because you know, some people, you know, there are projects that are titled like the big box, which is great, but for someone who's reading 1300, it's sort of don't know what that is. So anyway, I just think this is a really important thing. Thank you for that. Um, I think that, and, and I am less familiar with some of what's going on, but to that end, I think in the future looking at what gets funded and your long-term agenda of picking discrete cities, think about um, ways potentially that, or at least I'd like to suggest, that you look at programs as much as projects. That there are, are new initiatives that bring coalitions together and that maybe those are some of the opportunities that also exist for all of us to learn in the future. Um, and two last quick things and then I'll stop. Uh, moving, and I, I credit Greg Esser with some of the discussion we had on a bus last night, but the issue of how art our place is looking more in a policy direction. I think it's also important not to lose sight of what is the legislation. I hear all these political terms. I hear delegates. I hear meetings or convenings or conventions. It's all very political. What would be the end game? What would we all want as a piece of legislation that literally ties government agencies together, how money gets dispersed? Um, that might be something worth considering. Policy comes and goes. But thinking about long-term legislative impact would be a catalytic force, I think, for many of us. Um, and uh, the last thing is, um, on this issue of uh, rural and urban, I tend to work in economically distressed areas. I think that a lot of the lessons that smaller communities have are applicable in urban neighborhoods, though not in urban context. And I think that that, to me, is a slight distinction from what you were suggesting. But um, we are going to host in Greensboro in the fall um, a conference, which I cordially invite every and all of you. And I'll post it up to the Facebook page. Right. It's called Cross Currents, Art and Agriculture Powering Rural Economies. And it's three days, and we're going to explore the role of artists, artisans, and designers in those um, initiatives. Excellent. So, so thank you. Three quick things. One, let's capture something around policy and legislation, informal policy, formal policy, and legislative action. Um, two, just in terms of the sort of commons, identify yourself, do what you need to do, I invited myself to Janet's conference. So I emailed her last week and said, I just heard about this, I'd really like to come, may I come? So you know, we don't always have to wait to be invited, we can also ask. And then three, it's getting to be 10.30. Maria, Sarah, and I don't have to go anywhere. I'm eager to hear from everyone. So people online, please do not leave. Anyone who needs to begin excusing themselves to catch your trains, catch your buses, catch your super shuttles, do any of that, please feel free to do that. And I don't want to turn this into a big applause moment and shut everything down, but I just want to especially, once again, thank Liz Crane, especially thank our colleagues from Esperanza, and just thank everyone who's played a hand in, in sort of running this. So. We're going to keep going with this until I've had a chance to hear from everyone who wants to talk to me. But again, really, you have permission to get up and leave as you need to um, and storm out. Make it look like you're reacting to somebody's something. Exactly. Right. I'll, Boston, I'll throw the mic down and just be very, okay. very quick. Steven Zachs from Flint Public Art Project. And I just wanted to make a quick pitch for the idea that this is about an experience that people
active process of community engagement on the one side, and then there's on the other side uh, an engagement of an artist who brings something that is unimaginable to me as, as an organizer, as an administrator, that comes from their unique pra practice. And I, and I, I would echo what, what NATO was talking about in terms of in, engaging the, the art, artist community. There's something, I'm, I'm constantly trying to bring new artists from you know, the most innovative practices of design, public art, um, uh, architecture, into Flint, Michigan, to bring uh, this this kind of uh, Im imaginative impetus that I I don't have, but what happens is when you bring those two things together, some something ma magical that transforms places. Um, on on the theme of it, the the silo, uh, one of our projects was to do temporary public art installations. Uh, on six-story concrete silos in a natural spring a couple of blocks from downtown Flint. Probably no one knew that those existed before we did temporary projects there, and that was the point, transforming these unacknowledged um, places into public places where large numbers of people came, and you had a six-story swing with people. You know, if you, if you put a, a six-story swing up you swing very far. It's like <laughs> it, it, it's like becoming su Superman. So um, that you know th things like that, and and so I want to just make a pitch for the idea that along with a, a movement or a field, it's also about a, 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 an un uncanny magical experience that happens when you combine really intensive, great community engagement with really imaginative art. So thanks to Art Place for, for supporting uh, that, that, which wouldn't have been possible. And I think there's something sort of embedded in that and in a lot of the artist conversations that I don't know the right way to capture this, Sarah, so you know, fix this after I say it. Um, but I think there's something around the notion of needing to invest in translators or needing to invest in the liminal figures mm -hmm. who can help make those connections, who can help do the code shifting. Someone, I can't remember if it was John or who it was, was talking about having a permitting issue. And so when I was working in city government, we literally hired someone at the permitting office who spoke art and could sort of say, there's a program in New York called Make Music New York, which is celebration free outdoor music, our answer to Fête de la Musique on June 21st. And when he showed up to his local police station and said, I want to put 100 trombones on the corner, the police officers were like, go away, you know, just get out of here. But we were able to hire someone who was literally able to say, oh, okay, we want to have a First Amendment congregation that involves non-amplified individuals, blah, 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 <laughs> and you don't need a permit for that. And it was like, okay. And so with this one code switcher, Aaron Friedman now sits down and has a meeting with all of the New York City precincts and does all the permitting for 1300. So I think there's something around that notion of code switching, the person who speaks the magical and the person who speaks the bureaucratic so that those adjacencies can happen. I There's think something really about powerful. code switching and also the, the glossary development, right? right? So right. What, are, what are the terms that are beginning to be shared right. as this community, field movement, whatever it is, moves on? What's the language that holds it together in addition to what's the language that allows it to grow? Right. And what's the language we use differently? I, I don't know if my, I think some of my NEA colleagues might be here. We once had a hysterical meeting with the Office of Management and Budget about performance measures. And at the NEA, we were talking about something very different than they were talking about at OMB. So also, what are the words that we use differently? That's funny. Cindy. Hi, <clears throat> Cindy. Again, I'll be quick since I did give a couple of comments earlier. One is, um, I think, in, on the area of capturing stories, I think it would be really wonderful for uh, us and maybe with the uh, assistance of the new communications person to capture the stories about the unintended consequences of our work. We all go out with our initial goals and what we think we're going to do. And I think some of the most amazing things happen with the unintended things that occur. Um, for instance, because we're working with so many art and technology people, I mean, really partly as a result of that and those relationships, we have the inaugural Southwest Maker Fest happening in Mesa in a couple of weeks was not part of our Art Place grant, but it's happening and it, it was directly related to the work. Um, I think capturing those stories will be part of um, the ability to 
uh, engender excitement in people outside our circle. So I think something around unanticipated consequences that needs to attach to both the sort of communication strategy, but also the measurement strategy. That's right. Right? Yes. I mean, I think sort of we've got to leave room for what we didn't know was going to happen. Yeah, and the second thing is similar to um, the reading list and the list of conferences, but a little more um, specific would be, I would love to find a way for us to have on the site when it's uh, redeveloped, um, a place where uh, those of us uh, who are Art Place grantees can post when we're going to a conference, uh, whether it's an arts conference or <clears throat> community development conference or whatever, where we could post it and 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 among ourselves create the opportunity for uh, a, con a, a gathering, whether it's formal or informal, whether it's coffee or drinks or or an actual meeting at the conferences like APAP that allow you to book a room for you know a, a cohort. Um, but to create that opportunity to touch base at those different conferences and to bring interested colleagues from whatever conference we're at so that that can be part of our proselytizing, but it also can be a way of building our network at places we're already going, we're already paying to travel, and we're going to be there together sharing ideas and getting inspired. So why not use that to ignite some, some thinking while we're there? I love that. And just one thing to sort of make explicit in that, I think as if we're sort of in this sort of commons delegate frame, what's also really powerful about that is in some cases, if one of us is going, others of us might not have to go. In a world of limited travel budgets and limited time and limited all of that, if we, when we, you know, when, if I get invited to attend the Revolution conference, if I go to that conference with the responsibility of reporting into the conference from the field, from the movement, from the community, as well as take the responsibility for reporting back out, there's a way I think we can do more with, with fewer. So I love that idea. So if we could capture something around sort of um, always be fully in our creative placemaking delegate subject position, which is the worst sentence ever created <laughs> in the English language. Lori. Thanks. Uh, my name is Lori. I'm from the Design Studio for Social Intervention in Boston. Uh, working in Upham's Corner in Dorchester. And I want to come back to this conversation about um, forms and language. And I think as we think about a field or a movement, like forms, forms are slippery and they slide in ahead of us. And this form is a particular form. So when we think about, oh, we could have done better, we could have identified the artists in the room, I think it's deeper than that because artists wouldn't engage in this form. We're very cloaked. You know, it, if we were creating this as a set of artists, and we looked at how many hands there were, it might look very different. You know? So as a design studio supporting artists, we would be thinking a lot more about like, how are we getting together and prototyping stuff? How are we getting our hands on stuff? How am I getting your ideas? How am I you know, thinking about what would Cat in a Hat do? Like that's one of our superhero muses. You know? So like, what would they bring? Not just like, oh, I'm an artist, you know, but what would that, how would this look different? And I think we talked some about movement, you know, and, and how many cloaked organizers are in the room? How many folks would identify as an organizer in their community? How would this space look different? You know, like organizers know a lot about language justice and we heard a lot about how our communities are changing. Like we haven't had any language justice. We haven't had any translation. We haven't, we haven't even necessarily translated into field speak, let alone into Spanish or other languages. So I think there's some things, um, I was talking this morning with someone thinking about the merchants in this area as, as LA downtown LA starts to shift like how many merchants are in the room you know if you're a merchant like this we might have had two hours and a bunch of vending booths we might have had great swag we might have learned just walking around a convention like what all of us do like there's forms that we could learn from that I think would be interesting and more than just saying oh I'm an artist or I'm a this or a that so I'd be interested in thinking like when we convene something that looks like this what are we leaving out of the room so not just not just where we convene, not just who we convene, but how we convene. Yeah, yeah, I think it's the yeah. H that's the really important thing that's been missing up yeah. till now from the conversation. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much for that. And, and maybe that's a, a good segue. I'm Nancy from Esperanza Community Housing. <laughs> thank you. Um, and thank you for this, for this convening. This has really been a wonderful opportunity for us. Um, I wanted to go back to something that Boston said earlier that um, he had made a suggestion about mentees and interns. Um, I'd like to suggest that uh, Art Place take that very, very seriously in terms of encouraging grantees to think that way, even if they would opt out. Mm -hmm. um, Esperanza has been a very fortunate um, grantee of the Durfee Family Foundation, which is a Los Angeles-based 
Foundation. And one of the things that they did for those of us who were awarded a sabbatical award from that foundation was to provide a professional development pot of funds um, that you could accept with the responsibility that you use it for staff originated um, expressions of need for professional development. You could opt away from it, but the encouragement was there for every sabbatical awardee to really take very seriously the need for every member of the staff to have professional development opportunities. And I think if Art Plays, just to honor what Boston suggested, we've a couple of things that have been mentioned in terms of who's not in the room are youth, except now we have Damon here with us today, but the youth and also community members that if Art Place did include an opt-out um, additional pot of funding so that organizations could be encouraged to think about what they would do with an intern or a mentee, it would regenerate some of these concepts into the next generation and bring other people in the room who aren't uh, with us at this convening. It's important. I know we captured something around the staff intern mentee welcoming in. If we haven't, let's also capture the professional development theme, because I know that's one that Boston also has brought up. Thank Chris, you. Thank you so much, Nancy. Coming right back. Okay. Uh, Chris. Chris Beck with the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture. Two comments, one very specific to uh, our work at agriculture. Uh, my sense, um, one thing we've learned in the federal practice around placemaking over the last few years is that a lot of the communities that start doing land use planning, transportation integration, placemaking, they also end up doing stuff related to food. Mm -hmm. And this is, you all know that in your communities. And so I, I would, I think that as you start looking at in, in the practice of creative placemaking that we figure out what that food link is. And so it's not just incidental and ad hoc, but, um, and that's a, one role that USDA uh, can, can help with, but other agencies as well. So that's one specific comment. And the other one has nothing to do with with uh, uh, USDA, but um, so I have a bias having been in, in government and politics most of my professional life, and I think in the, when I go to sessions like this, there's very little talk about our elected officials and our members of Congress and legislatures and sometimes local mayors and things. And I think we might think about how in this practice, we are intentional, more intentional, and get some help figuring out how to engage the people who are actually going to change the rules, the zoning, the funding for not just arts, but creative placemaking. It's a lot of work, and some of you are good at it. It's been, you, you know you have to deal with your local people for this and that. Some of us are not good at it. We just don't do it. Um, the foundations that, that fund Art Place generally stay away from politics, and, and, and this isn't really about politics. It's, it's about just making sure the people who are going to make creative placemaking work are um, informed about the work you're doing. A lot of them just don't know what you're doing really well, and then even when they find out about it, what can we do to get them to do something else about it, which changes the rules about transportation and land use, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's more street diets and, and integrating arts and all those things. But, but it won't happen on its own. And you are also good social entrepreneurs, and your stories are inspiring. They are non-political stories. Your work is essentially non-political. And I think that is an advantage you have over other types of work, which can engage politicians, uh, elected officials on all sides of the aisle. But I think you uh, need help. And Art Place, I would hope, would think about how to, to help you all as a group do that better with your, your people so that translates to better uh, local, state, and federal policy and funding. So I think that's so important. And so just to translate it into one of those have need dyads, I think people have a lot of anxiety about what's appropriate ways to engage with government and what's legal and all of that. Um, and I think what we need is to, is to help people feel more comfortable with that. 
the rules are really clear, and there are people who know them, the Hatch Act and all these other things, so that it's absolutely allowable for us to get into the policy arena, it's absolutely allowable for us to get in the legislative arena, the zoning, all of that. So I think we need to add into that policy legislation thing to make sure we're sort of documenting how you do that to capture the, you know, the ways you do that that are totally appropriate and fine for foundations, for 501c3s, for everyone else. It also underscores champion building, though. Yes, absolutely, yeah, 100%. Champion building in really uh, key places. And did we get champion building in that language, Sarah? If we haven't, let's add it. Thanks so much. Rico. Hi, I'm Rico Worrell from Sea Alaska Heritage Institute in Juneau, Alaska. Uh, I, I had a, um, I mean, I, I like, the ideas of the talk about movement, and there's a lot of talk about art, bringing artists in, but uh, I think, if, especially if we're talking about movement, we should be thinking about not how we're bringing artists in, but how we're, how we're bringing what's here out to artists. Um, and I, I, I have a, a, a suggestion is that, you know, I also liked the comment earlier, someone mentioned about, about it's, uh, there's a lot of strength in lifestyle and branding, and, and um, you know, I have a friend who's who's really kind of playing with the idea of hash, uh, hashtag creative hustle, and you know, there's a lot of hashtag creative hustle, creative hustle. Yeah. So there's a lot of people out there that are doing that, and they just relate to it, and so they start, you know, share, you know, hashtagging that on things that they're, you know, uh, working on. Um, another thing that I've, a, I, I'm a, a entrepreneur myself, so I go to a lot of websites that have to do with creative entrepreneurship, and uh, I, a suggestion that I was going to make is that I think, um, you know, a, a direction that would be really powerful for Art Places website is to is to be a place for sharing kind of resources or articles on uh, related to, you know, if 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 we're if we're using you know a hashtag creative placemaking. Um, you know, I, I go to a, a website that's 99U, to, and I often share website, share articles there to my what fellow is creative. I don't know 99U. What is 99U? It's, it's just like an entrepreneur kind okay. of got website, it. just resources. So, you know, to, an equivalent for our place would be kind of be like articles about, um, you know, some articles about, you know, the things that we're doing in the room, but also like articles that say, you know, how do we deal with, uh, you know, 10, 10 suggestions of how to reach out to your, your city council and uh, influence creative change Great. or, uh, um, you know, tools that I would be able to later email to other people in my office, you know, or other people in my, that I, uh, that I speak to on my social media. So uh, just something that's, you know, shareable and, and uh, that, that way it kind of influences the lifestyle or gets into the lifestyle that's already out there because I know that for every one of us in here, there's like another hundred or thousand out there that's 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 doing doing work that we're doing as well. And I think I, that's so important. And I think you in particular have some important lessons to share as someone who's fully an artist and as someone who fully sat on a planning commission, right? right so I right. mean, you've you've inhabited some of these multiple subject positions right, and yeah. had to do some of that code switching. So it's yeah. multiple how tos. Yeah. Yeah. How to take action. Absolutely, Rico. Thank you Great. so much. I'm Margaret from the state of Connecticut, and I just wanted to speak to the who's not at the table question. Um, besides uh, space reuse, my other expertise is access. So I wanted to talk about access challenges when we're taking over old buildings, and that everyone makes places, and how can we integrate further um, the unseen populations, re-entry, immigrant populations, and everything we do, because I really believe that that's some of the strength of this project is who's at the table. And I hope we could uh, develop like a toolkit of uh, problems and solutions. So it sounds like that you're both talking about sort of universal design, physical access, as well as sort of universal design in terms of the gestalt of a place, in terms of the programming, so that people are both physically able to come in and all people are are socially welcome, culturally welcome to come in the, as well. uh, the disabled are the largest minority in the world. The numbers are growing, so we have to really get ahead of the curb in when we're planning all of our cultural work to welcome these other cultural con contributors that people don't consider usually, but I think that everybody in this room is kind of on that page. So I hope on the website we can have a dialogue or a little uh, area where we could talk about um, how to further that movement. Right. I think that's great. And there, I have a colleague at the NEA who does a lot of work around accessibility. 
And the thing she said that's always a powerful reminder to me is that any of us can become disabled at any time. That's right. Right. I mean, I can walk outside and get into an accident and lose a leg. Well, and so it's something that even if we're not currently, it's something that each of us has a real personal investment in. We were able to leverage an NEA grant and a grant from the National Artists with Disabilities Center to do more access work in our Art Place grants because our state is was not one of the, the really great access state, but it's going to become one, and this grant has enabled us to get further on that path with everything we do, so thank you. Fabulous. Are you in conversation with Beth Bienvenue at the end? Yes. NBA? Great. Excellent. Ha ha. Um, Andrew Kasdan, City of LA, Department of Cultural Affairs. I wasn't planning on being the last person to speak. It just worked <laughs> out that way. You can do the opposite of a welcome to LA. But I would it. like to uh, thank you for hosting the, or for holding the conference in Los Angeles. It was truly an honor to, to have you there. Uh, one thing that really excites me is the fact that Art Place is going to be looking into creating a research component to its um, operations. And there's a thread throughout all of the Art Place grants of community engagement and um, it, in fact community organization can become a component. Uh, and it would be interesting to me to see what um, types of best practices various grantees have used successfully to um, ensure that there is some kind of community consensus that can be reached. Because one um, area that you know our department has put a lot of work into is to outreach and to engage not only the stakeholders or the institutions that are involved in projects, but those that are disenfranchised, that aren't necessarily artists or are community members that don't necessarily become involved in artistic explorations and community development projects. So, you know, to look at what types of best practices could be used in both urban and rural communities to bring various constituencies together to really truly create a community consensus that can have a lasting impact would be of great interest to me. I think that's great. Thank you. Yeah. That's great. It's proactive Excellent. inclusion. Yeah. yeah. All right. So I think everyone who has wanted to has had a chance to speak. Excellent. Maria, any last thoughts? Any things you want to make sure get in the room? No, I, th I think this has been really rich and we, we touched not only on the initial overarching themes that were brought up, but, but uh, went deep, really deep in some of them. I think that there were a lot of uh, concrete, doable uh, ideas. So I'm really eager to hear how this community becomes even more a community of doers. Right. Um, as, as Art Place goes forward and as this whole idea of a common ground begins to blossom. Excellent. Well, I think that's great. And as I think it's the only the appropriate thing to do is give Liz Crane the last word of the Art Place 2014 LA conference. So Liz, how do you want to send us all home? That was, that was a lot of- And not with logistics. That I was, want to hear the word bus. That was a lot of, um, that was a lot of pressure. I, I do want to thank Andrew, um, Andrew Kasdan and the, and the Department of Cultural Affairs in LA. They were a wonderful help in putting together this conference. Um, and I, want to, I also want to thank um, Leanne and Sarah who are over there working in the, in the shadows, <laughs> um, who are doing wonderful things and have been so great. There have been so many um, amazing people. Obviously Esperanza and Damon and everything that you guys did last night was incredible. We all know that. Um, and the Irvine Foundation for, for being a part of that was, was wonderful. There's um, Josephine, yay! Yay! <laughs> and our HowlRound folks, I just want to introduce Vijay here who's been doing all of the wonderful live streaming work. And he, once you look at it later, if you decide to watch it all again, you'll see just how amazing it's coming out for all of his hard work. And Polly and David and Jamie, I don't know if she's in the room, um, but they, they were a great help to us throughout this whole process. And all of the speakers and all of you guys and everybody who led a session or participated or sat at a table, we're just, again, we're, we're so thankful for all of your input. And we're so excited to, um, to start this next, um, this next iteration of, of what we're doing with the creative placemaking. Um, I will talk about buses, but I think we can probably